he was first married. My husband came from, he was educated, but he came from a narrow environment. He used to say, do you always have to pick something new? And he was really kind of right on, in other words, because I could read something. I had the ability, I didn't know it at the time, but I had the ability to read something that hadn't happened before, and I had the nerve to act on it. And it wasn't until after I collected art many years that I sort of even could, could verbalize what I was doing, but that's exactly what I was doing. No, there were, th those were actually bought from uh, Urban Blum Gallery. I wasn't the first, but other people were collecting them. I would have collected the soup cans, but my dear husband came to the gallery with me and said, do we have to have soup cans next to those George Herms full of termites in our living room? And I took pity, <laughs> it's pretty good. In other words, I brought all this art in, he was fascinated by me, he didn't understand it, but, and all of his colleagues would say, you're letting, you're letting your art, you're letting your wife do that, you're letting your wife do that. <laughs> And he would say back, if you're letting your wife buy a mink coat, well, there's nothing wrong with that, they would say. <laughs> <laughs> but now I don't have dogs because I have somewhere, I haven't counted lately, somewhere between 600 and 900 words of art. And I, I just can't vision myself cleaning the, the hair off of all of those. <laughs> but I do really like animals. <laughs> I just found myself doing it, and that's one of the things that. I got from preparing for you people today is look closely at the little fridge things that you're doing because that may lead you into something that you hadn't really thought about before. I really had never thought about art. I mean, I went and took this course at a junior college and then after that I, I taught school and I felt badly because they to let me go because I was teaching the kids. The curriculum was very, very loose at the school in the 1950s. And, they, and I taught the kids to read very well from the soup cans that they brought to school. Well, this didn't go over very well, and I wasn't invited to come back. And then after, and so that was like 19, that was about 1952. And then I realized as I was teaching school, I could do without the teaching school, but I really did like these experience charts for kids, and I started seeing more visual things. So it's kind of like, I wasn't leading myself, but I was leading myself because I was allowing myself to define the experiences that I had. I didn't know what teaching was, you know, you, you take a, Years of course, you read all this theory and it doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I've discovered from the opportunity to come and talk to you people today is what creativity is. In other words, I've made all these decisions along of deciding to buy, the, deciding to acquire various artists. If you're creative, it just pours out of you. You don't necessarily know what you're doing, but you're just doing something. And you need to do it, and you build something on it. And that's, in other words, there are artists that can do, a, can fill a whole museum with what they do overnight, and then there are other artists that tell you, oh, I couldn't let that go. I couldn't let you have that. And that's, that took me too long to do it. I've been working too hard on it. For the most part, I've seen that, you know, art is not work. It's something that you just need to do, and you do it, and it comes out. If it doesn't come out, if it's too hard, maybe you should find something else. The people that are telling me they're working too hard, <laughs> I wish them well. But that's one of the keys that I know not to collect, that don't, they don't interest me as artists because that's not what art is to me. Well, what happened to me was the creative process, which I didn't understand. You look at something, it creates a new world for you, it keeps talking to you, everything else kind of goes by the side, and this is the thing that you make this magnetic connection to and you decide that you want it. Oh, it's wonderful because you see more in the work all the time, and then you get to share it with other people, and they see things in it that you don't see in it, and then you have to install the work, and then I realized, 
Gee, the reason I'm having such an easy time installing this work is that everything seems to match everything else. And then I realized if one person picks a whole collection, everything, without realizing it, you've integrated everything with everything else, so that you can't really make any mistakes. At that time, people thought, you don't have black things in your living room. Mm -hmm. Black things doesn't, don't go with a couch. Well, <laughs> I didn't have a couch. <laughs> I was just, and that's a, one of the things that I wanted, as I'm thinking about this lecture, is you have to really be focused on what you want to do. I think it's much harder to be an artist today than it was to be an artist 50 years ago because there's so many things that can uh, entice you to want to do with your time. And there are a lot of artists, they're very good people, but they don't really spend much time in their studio. And maybe that's all right if they want to just have art as a form of expression, and they just want to exp know the environment that they live in. But if you really want to have a career, it's like anything. You know, if you're going to be an artist, you've got to really expect. You've got to be a nine to five person, and you've got to come home and do your work, and then you've got to network. And don't be surprised if you're working 100 hours a week every week. Well, I think the anti-establishment artists, part of what they were about was in their aesthetic. In other words, whether it was Wallace Berman or George Hearns or even folks, it was the discarded element. It wasn't the new and the beautiful and the shiny. Because they were not about the new and the beautiful and the shiny. They were about history as they saw it whether it was Wallace Berman and the occult, or whether it was George Hearns composing poetry out of trash. Mm -hmm. They came from that. And when people in these people's lives no longer seemed, seemed to be more established, but they lost interest in them because, and if you were still interested in their work, too bad for you. Because they were so dedicated to who they were and what they were about. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to uh, one of the artists in my collection, which we didn't picture, which sort of was a, a mentor to me, kind of was interested in what I was doing, and I collected her work, and that was Shirley Pettibone. She recently died, and I just, and uh, she was very good to everybody in the art world. In other words, she could have been a critic herself. She chose just to do her own art. She was a photorealist. And, uh, didn't make any difference who it was, if they were in the arts, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent. She gave all of herself to these people. And uh, her work is very lovely. Uh, the rhythm and the pace and the flow of how she painted is hers. The invention, there's not much there, but that's so what? Because I'm being as old as I am, I'm very interested in having my life come together. Uh, and I think when you're young, you're more interested in not knowing whether you're gonna, whether your life is gonna come together, and you're just putting yourself out there to see different things. I, I think there's a certain period in your life where you can have, where you can be a starving artist. But when it gets to the point where you're 50 and 60 and you're living in your car, it's time for you to be an adult. <laughs> Through this lecture, I've analyzed how I did what I did. Now, I saw other Richets at the, at, at, at the Ferris Gallery. So I was exposed to Richets. Sometimes I was exposed to them through dealers. Sometimes I found people on my own. And Think. No, I, I was exposed to this through seeing a Rouché show curated probably by Irving Bloom or Walter Hobbs. Then in 60, this was in 64, and in 66 or 67, when we saw that thing, that note by John Cruz about uh, uh, Holmes. What? About George Holmes. Yeah. Uh, I had been to the, that's at the, about the time that I had been to Ed Ruscha's studio, and I bought the print Hollywood that's about 29, I don't know, 30 or 40 inches wide and about 15 inches high. It's the portrait of the sign of the Hollywood Hills. It's oranges and, and uh, violet colors. 
cents. So that's a, uh, that was the second crochet that I bought. This one was $30. This is a print. And the uh, crochet uh, was, uh, I think, $85. But Rocher was an always good businessman. I think he, he did books, he kept receipts, he sold me that. He says, you pay for it first, and then you can come and get it. He's with all the artists that I've collected. I think he's the only one that said, you got, you know, you sign for this, you pay for it, you come and get it. Wow. Everybody okay. laughed at it. That encouraged me to bid on it. <laughs> it was an auction in 1964. And there, the auctioneer's name was Ernest Raboff. Why well, I still remember it, I don't know, because Orlando was asking me questions about what was Gita Conte's performance like? What do you remember about that? And I really had to scratch my Finally, I remembered a little something about it. But this was in 64. Gita Conte's performance was in 72. Anyway, um, I bid on it. And I, I knew what I was doing, because I knew who Ed Bruchet was. I liked Ed Bruchet. I liked the Ferris Gallery. By that time, I had been going to the Ferris Gallery. Well, that was 64. probably four or five years, so I knew who he was. I was just out there early looking around. Mm -hmm. Wallace Berman believed that he would, he would die at age 50, and he died on his 50th birthday. Born in 1926, and he died in 1956. No, 1976. I think he committed suicide. I think it was a part of his occult, anti-establishment mentality to do that. I think he went out on his 50th birthday, and he came home from the bar late at night, and I think that he didn't, he was going down to Panga Highway, got more to drink than he needed to drink, and he was hit by a, a truck. And there's a lot of conceptual material into the work. In other words, you had to really figure out what it was. Why was the nun there with her hat off? Why was the butterfly there with the motorcycle uh, motor? I didn't realize what conceptual art was at the time, but Howard Fox came, earlier on came over. Howard Fox used to be the curator of contemporary art, one of the curators of contemporary art. At Lackman, he came over to the house and he said, "You got contemporary. You got a lot of conceptual art here. I didn't. I didn't always know what I had. I knew that I needed it and I could verbalize about it, but I couldn't really define it. I think it was '62 when Warhol showed his soup cans, and uh, I didn't know why I wanted one, but I know I wanted one. Well, I guess." I didn't remember the fact that I've been teaching kids to read with soup cans. So I said, well, let's get one. You know, they were all of $100. That's when my husband said, do we have to have soup cans hanging in our living room next to the George Herms termites? And uh, you know, my husband was very sympathetic to what I was doing. He didn't particularly understand it, but he, he was kind of fascinated because he came from what you would call a Jewish a shtetl. A shtetl is a group, a small group of people that only mix with each other. It's a Yiddish word. And he was tired of that. But yet he didn't, he couldn't understand necessarily what I was doing. By the end of our marriage, he was more or less he trained his own eyes so that he could see things for himself. He locked himself in this locker here. And every morning his wife would bring liquid food and put it in this upper case. And then there were holes in the locker and he would excrete what he needed to excrete in the lower locker. He stayed in there. Instead of writing his master's degree, he stayed in here for five days. So. Tom Garver, who was then curator of the Newport Art, Art Museum, took us over to see Chris. And then I came back down and I photographed this. And I then I talked to, to Chris Burton after he was out. He stayed in there for five days and five nights. 
sitting in the locker in the in this you know with his knees bent and his arms bent and just you know crushed into himself. And uh, so I said, well, what what was it like? He says it wasn't bad at all in there. He says what was bad is my wife came to get me at five o'clock in the afternoon, and I had to prep to crunch back in the back seat and hide from the traffic. He says, after all of that quiet and containment to be out in the world with all that movement around me just about killed me. And he was arrested outside of the gallery down the street from the Ferris. The Ferris Gallery was near Melrose and St. Mend and uh, was on La Cienega. And uh, this was right in the general area. The Ferris Gallery was 723, and this is 629. He was uh, arrested. <coughs> he was pretending to be dead on the street and been covered with a carpet. And somebody called the police. And uh, William Wilson, who unfortunately now is suffering from Parkinson's disease, was there. And William Wilson said, this is not art. And me, I always have to put my, my mouth where I, sh where I should or shouldn't. It depends upon who's talking to me. I discussed with him and said why I thought it was art at the time. And then he wrote an article somewhere. I, I don't think it was about this thing, but he wrote an article. And he, he, uh, he, called, he called me Diana Shotgun Slotnik. I had to look up in the dictionary. didn't really realize what shotgun meant, but I did. And uh, I think I went to the trial. It's, it's mm -hmm. at the bottom there. That yeah, you, Beverly Hills Court. And I don't think I don't think I think he, I think he got off, or somebody else paid paid his fine. I don't remember the details of that. The thing that interested me is that they were doing their own thing. My mother was always interested in clothes, and uh, I don't think she ever went to a museum, but she was interested in, you know, I mean, she didn't know French history, but she was interested in French furniture and nice clothing. And I was bored by all that. I, was, I, wanted, I wanted something more in my life than, than going shopping and furnishing a house, which is what today most people, what good Americans do that are the good business people, the neighborhood I live in. They're doctors, they're plumbers, they're electricians. And they all lead these very kind of, I mean, it's fine for them, and I like them, and they're nice people, but I could never live that way. I could never take the time out to buy curtains for my house. I have a nice house in an expensive neighborhood, but I just have cardboards on the window because I can't be bothered going shopping to buy drapes. 